Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the start of our uh, half day event on mental health and politics. I'm Jordan, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Nominee. And we are so excited to be hosting this event alongside our partners at Apathy is Boring, the Canadian Mental Health Association, and the Democratic Engagement Exchange here at Toronto Metropolitan University. We are also live streaming this event on LinkedIn and on Instagram. So thank you for everyone who is able to join here in person and online um, and for taking time out of your weekend for this important conversation that I think hope will be inspiring, uplifting and hopeful on a topic that is so critical as we start to think about what we want the future of politics to look like. It can be tough to talk about your mental health and it's a topic that is still, even in 2023, associated with a stigma that can be hard to break through, especially in politics. But things are changing. Politicians all over the world are stepping up and sharing their stories. And today we have four incredible panelists, George Smith, Maria Monsaf, Laura May Lindo, and Haban Ali, who will share their own experiences and stories with us. And by doing so, they're showing all of us that it's okay to talk about your mental health. They're empowering others to open up, to reach out and to get help if they need it. And that's why it's so important to be having these conversations because mental health affects every, every one of us and no one should feel like they need to suffer in silence because they feel too embarrassed or ashamed or afraid to, to speak out and get the help that they need or, or too guilty. And that's what breaking the stigma is all about. That's why we're here today. And so thank you to our panelists for participating and sharing their thoughts and wisdom with us uh, in this conversation. We are living in a time where there seems to be constant turmoil. And it's important to remember that the people that we elect to represent us in our parliaments, in our legislatures, city halls, and the staff that support them, they're only human. And that's easy to forget in an increasingly polarized and partisan political environment where it's become so easy for folks to demonize and dehumanize politicians and we certainly see evidence of this on social media. We know it's hard to engage in politics today. And, and the reality is that it's getting tougher and tougher to recruit people into office and to convince them to run for office, but also to retain good people once they are elected and support them to be able to stay in office and do the important work that they're there to serve. But it's not too late to turn things around. And this cuts to the core of our mission at Nominee and why we wanted to do this event in our work to train, equip, and empower the next generation of political leaders. We, everything we do is centered around supporting the well being of people services, serving in office, running for office, working on campaigns, working in government because building better political leadership that can effectively deal with 21st century challenges demands that we all do politics differently. And so we've just released Campaign 101, which is our first flagship online course on how to run for office and win an election. But we've combined that with that practical training with a focus on the human side of politics, leaning into authentic leadership and what that looks like in the political space so that we're centered around common values and well-being. Next, we'll be teaming up again with the Canadian Mental Health Association and Apathy is Boring to, to bring out a mental health toolkit, which will have you know, more practical um, guidelines, best practices and support and resources um, to be able to turn this into action. Later next year, we'll be releasing our second flagship course, this time on political leadership, which 
will help build the core skills around um, everything from mental health and resilience to negotiation and diplomacy that is so important as you build 21st century leaders at all levels of government. So this event today is really the first step in a much larger initiative as we continue our work to build awareness and break down some of the barriers and stigma that still exists around mental health and civic engagement. As we move through this session, I'd like you all to, to think about two things. Number one, spend some time reflecting on your own experience with mental health in politics. How does politics make you feel? What do you want to learn or come away with today and what questions do you have? We want this to be as engaging and as interactive as possible. So for the folks joining us online, feel free to jump in with your comments and questions. And of course, we will have a Q&A at the end of the panel as well, where folks can ask their questions on the topic to our panelists. The second thing I would love to, uh, to have you guys consider is your own call to action. You know, and think about, you know, we've got a huge wide range of, of folks in the room today and online. Some of you are elected officials, some of you are political staff, others represent political organizations or advocacy groups or nonprofits that, so we all engage in politics in different ways. But think about however you can engage in politics, what's next? How can you apply what you learned today to support yourself and support others? How can you elevate and amplify this conversation and the work that you do? Uh, and, and you know, finally, how can you advocate for the importance of wellness and well-being in politics? Because if we are going to encourage more people to run for office, more people to engage in politics while providing safer, healthier environments for them to do that work in, then it's going to take all of us, all of us at the table to really create systemic change and, and lasting impact in systems that work for the communities we serve. I hope that this event will help inspire you to build on this conversation in your own way and in your own communities. So with that in mind, a quick rundown of the events. We'll kick things off with a conversation with our panelists who have seen it all in politics uh, and are here to share their stories, their thoughts on how we can do things better. And at the end of the day, why politics is still worth it. We will end the live stream after the panel for the folks joining us on LinkedIn and Instagram. And for the people here with us in Toronto, we'll break for some refreshments and then regroup for a workshop led by the CMHA to, to start putting some of these topics that we're learning about into more practical tools and coping mechanisms that you can take home with you. Additionally, we'll uh, wrap up with some time to relax, connect and get to know each other before we finish at 2 p.m. Um, so if you see me, come up say hi, I would love to meet you and uh, start having those conversations. Before we dive in, we are incredibly fortunate to be hosting this event at the beautiful Ted Rogers School of Management here at TMU. And I wanted to say a special thank you to the team at TMU for supporting this event. TMU's Democratic Engagement Exchange has been doing incredible work to build a more vibrant and inclusive democracy in Canada. So I'd like to invite their director, John Beebe, to say a few words about why this conversation matters and how it intersects with his work here at TMU. Thank you, John. Thank you. Yeah, great. Hi. Uh, so my name is John Beebe, and I lead the Democratic Engagement Exchange here in the Faculty of Arts at TMU. Um, and on behalf of TMU, uh, I'd just like to say thank you to the team at Nominee and Jordan and his team there and Sam and the whole team with Apathy uh, for hosting this event, putting that on, convening this incredibly important conversation um, and more than conversation, the workshop, everything else behind it to help us address this barrier that people too often face uh, because you know, in this moment, it's critical 
that we have more people engaging, not less people engaging in our democracy. Um, so just a quick show of hands. I just want to see how people are feeling. How many of you have friends or family who are feeling more fragile in the world? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm feeling more fragile in the world. Um, you know, the other night I was at home, like many of us, my partner watching the bear. If you haven't seen it, you should definitely see it. Um, starting to cry you know, in the middle of a TV show. Um, and there's something about this moment um, that's impacting, I think, all of us differently. Um, and we need to have these conversations about what that looks like and how does that feel and how does that impact us? Um, because when we seek public office, something else different happens. We not are just for ourselves, we're representing our community. We're literally representatives of our community. So we take on everything that comes with that and the expectations that come with that and our own hopes and aspirations that come with that. Um, and we put ourselves in a very vulnerable position. And so again, that's why this conversation is so critical. Um, but the part that makes me hopeful in this really challenging time is you. Um, I look out here this morning, you know, and I see people who are willing to engage this conversation. I see people who I hope run for office. I see people who've done it, who've run for office, who've taken the risk, who put themselves out there for their communities. Um, and that really makes me hopeful. Uh, so thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, everyone who's online watching. Uh, and please stay engaged. Find your way in to your communities to be in this conversation, to not turn away, because that's the only way we're going to build a truly vibrant and inclusive democracy here in Canada. So thank you again, Jordan. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you very much, John, and thank you again to the team of, at TMU for supporting this event. Now, let's dive in. We've got an amazing panel coming up for you guys, and it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Justice Faith Betty. Justice is the co-creator of Revolutionaire, a space where every young change maker can make their voices heard and drive action and impact on the causes that they care about. She's a recognized entrepreneur and activist who is working to fulfill a lifelong commitment to advocacy and youth engagement, a dream that began when she was just eight years old. Please welcome Justice Faith Betty. All right, thank you so much, Jordan. Can everyone hear me? Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here today for this really, really important conversation on mental health and politics. And what's super, super exciting is that today's initiative is really a testament to the power of community and collaboration. I mean, look at these wonderful organizations who have come together for this essential topic that, quite frankly, deserves a lot more airtime. We often talk about mental health, Thank goodness, it's 2023. I'm glad this is not ne nearly as much of a taboo topic as it was even five or 10 years ago. We often talk about politi political uh, endeavors and politics more broadly, but this intersection is something that is so incredibly critical, especially in today's present day society. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our wonderful panelists today, beginning with Maria Monsef, who is the CEO of Onward, where she lends her skills as both a consultant as well as a speaker to causes and leaders that she is passionate about. She is also a new mom, former cabinet minister, and you can see her Monday nights on CTV's Power Play. Yes. 
We are delighted as well to have George Smitherman today, Director of Biome, and he has more than 30 years of experience in public service and government, having served at the municipal, provincial, and federal level, both as an elected politician and in support of senior official leaders. George. And it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. May Lindo, a respected at activist and educator who holds both a master's and PhD in education. Dr. Lindo is a knowledgeable advocate for the rights of women and girls, especially as a respected ally to vulnerable communities and a public speaker, ready, willing, and able to speak on issues that often are left unaddressed. Dr. Lindo. And finally, I'm super excited to introduce Haban Ali, a Somali Canadian community builder involved with initiatives, including the Prime Minister's Youth Council, Toronto Public Health's Youth Health Action Network, and the Mosaic Institute. Haban. So as Jordan mentioned, we'll be kicking today off with a wonderful conversation, really reflecting on the lived experiences of our panelists, as well as lessons and really tactical strategies for us all to take into our daily lives after we leave today. Of course, please uh, keep in mind any questions you might have. We'll definitely save time for that uh, before, of course, heading off to lunch and then enjoying the rest of the day with the wonderful workshop that has been planned. Alrighty, so let's dive in. Miriam, I would love to begin with you and reflecting on your personal journey from being a refugee to a federal cabinet minister, a globally recognized change maker and advocate for so many communities. Miriam, why was it important for you to be here today to talk about mental health and politics? Hey, Justice. Good morning, everybody. Bonjour, Ani. Salam alaikum. Uh, it was important for me to be here for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, who doesn't hate? Who doesn't like a little bit of political healing first thing on a Saturday morning? How many former or current staffers in the room? Raise your hands. Uh-huh. How many potential or former candidates in the room? Raise your hands. Okay, and how many people are just political nerds that just can't get enough, most of you? Um, so it was important for me to come for a number of reasons, Justice. First of all, um, I have made it my business to support leaders, both emerging leaders and existing leaders, thrive around the big tables. And what I do now post-politics is all about preparing leaders so that once you get to those positions of influence and power, you go into them eyes wide open with clear expectations for yourself and clear expectations from those who get you there. Uh, and so that's my North Star and there's alignment uh, for me to be here. I also think as uh, one of our uh, sponsors said earlier today, uh, that this is a really important time for a conversation about politics and well-being and mental health. The world is a complicated place and it's only going to get more complicated. And it's a really, really hard time to be a decision maker anywhere in the world. And we see that particularly here in Canada. There is no room for nuance, it seems, in these really complex times. And so, you know, having a conversation about well-being and mental health uh, is critical, uh, and I also was able to make it justice because my husband uh, agreed to come along and bring our nine-month-old. So there's there's a lot that's conspired to make sure I'm here on Haudenosaunee and Mississauga territory with you this morning, and I'm grateful. Thank you, and we are grateful for you, Miriam. So thank you so much for joining us. And George, over to you. Of course, we talked about your three decades of experience in public service. Curious as to hear about how your experiences have really influenced your perspective on mental health and politics. Uh, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, I want to acknowledge these traditional territories as, uh, as they have been and uh, also state that uh, this uh, territory here was my original territory when I was elected in 1999. Um, you know, I... 
I think like in mental health is inseparable for up for other health, but for a long, long time, when people said, how are you doing? You're only allowed to talk about your physical ailments. And I think over time now I get to say, well, physically I'm great, but you know, I could use one out of every 11 days off for uh, service and maintenance of the uh, old mind there. Um, so I, I don't really know how to answer your question perfectly well, except to say that you know, mental one's mental health, I suppose, is a uh, manifests itself in uh, in performance. And, you know, my uh, mental health coming out of ad adolescence was uh, framed up around uh, uh, operational perfection, outwork other people, etc. And really, actually, for the better part of my career in politics, I framed out my strengths alongside those things. What they didn't account for fully was that there were excesses to that, which were, uh, you know, which were a challenge. And, you know, um, I arrived 20 years ago as Minister of Health in a government that was more prepared to be open and talking about things. And then I suppose I forced Premier McGinty's hand by talking openly about a period in my life of addiction, which preceded my election to office and all of that. So, uh, I suppose intertwined in a sense and has always been my objective to try and bring challenging things into openness because I find that's, and that, that, that starts for me as a gay person where I worked in the government of David Peterson who embraced uh, sexual orientation as a re re reflected element of protection under the human rights code and that, you know, helped to frame out uh, for me the ability to come out from which I found the liberation from actually taking ownership of information, putting it in the public domain, et cetera. So not sure I've answered your question, but hopefully thrown enough tangents out there to move on to the next. You absolutely have answered the question, George, and looking forward to diving into discussion further. Dr. Lindo, over to you. In addition to holding a master's and PhD in education, being a recognized activist and educator, you were also Kitchener's first ever black MPP. Can you talk a little bit about the role of intersectionality in this conversation of mental health and politics? Oh, absolutely. And it's a really important question. Oh, as my brain goes flying, <laughs> which is kind of ironic. I'm just going to leave it there for everybody to gaze no, upon no. it. A powerful metaphor. <laughs> I, got it. I want to give her her brain back. My brain's back. Okay. Now my, my answer is going to be so much better. Okay. Um, I think we understand intersectionality in theory very well. Um, we understand that you're supposed to bring your whole being to work, etc. But when you enter into the political realm as um, holding identities that are typically marginalized, mm -hmm. that aren't reflected in that space, um, you start to internalize some of the issues around living an intersectional life mm -hmm. in a very different way and very publicly. Um, and then one of the things that you also notice is that I might be advocating for something from my position um, and my experiences as a black woman, but the world around me only sees my blackness. For some reason, I found that race was the, the identifying intersection that people saw most often. Oddly enough, um, the experiences that I was having as a single mummy, for instance, uh, raising three little people. When I was first elected in 2018, my little ones were three, um, 13, and 10. I don't know why I did it in that order, but that's who they were. And, um, and so I was at home by myself trying to get them to and from school and all of this kind of stuff, but then having to come into Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and... My, a lot of those issues are issues that people would say are within my being a woman. And yet my being a woman was not the thing that people were looking at. They were looking at me as, am I doing too much for my people as, black, as a black MPP? Mm. Anytime I spoke about race, it was, oh, she's only talking about that. In the meantime, a lot of the other work that you're doing isn't getting recognized. And I think uh, in, in that public capacity, um, when the work that you're doing isn't being seen, you hold that. Like there is a mental health toll to that. And then you find yourself having to work harder, faster, longer, um, just to have something seen when this intersectional world that we're living in doesn't necessarily, uh, in the words of Beyonce, I did it again. Uh, you always got to put Beyonce in there. In the words of Beyonce, 
they were not ready for the jelly. Wow. Whoa. Oh, mic drop moment. I'm just getting started. Okay. Well, Haban, over to you. Um, you, of course, are such an inspirational youth advocate, and you're making sure that the voices of our generation are heard in critical forums from the Prime Minister's Youth Council to decision-making rooms to reduce barriers to youth employment. Question as to, from the perspective of intersectionality as well, but also taking into account age, why was it important for you to be here today? second but thank you it's so nice to meet you in real life we're social media friends so that's always so sweet um, I'm a second generation Somali Canadian my parents are refugees who came to Canada in the 90s uh, following the Civil War and my first entry into the political space was working with our Prime Minister on the Youth Council so that was really eye-opening and for me it was really special we also have Brooks in the crowd Brooks, you can wave your hand. He was on the council with me. And we we had the really unique opportunity to uh, travel all across the country from Nunavut to Sherba, Quebec, and speak with youth about their experiences in Canada and what they hoped for and what they feared in their for their future as well. And this fed into Canada's first national youth policy. And it was very clear uh, at the end of these consultations that there's a very different reality of Canada depending on who you are, your postal code, the color of your skin, your socioeconomic status, Canada looked different for us. So I've always had one foot in the classroom and one foot in the door. Uh, and throughout my education, I always uh, conducted research in health geography, the social determinants of health. But for me, it wasn't enough to conduct the research, but how could we use this research to create change in our communities as well? So through through the Prime Minister's Youth Council, through experiences with uh, the Ontario Legislature Internship Program, I know we have some interns in the crowd, uh, and, and other avenues, I was really able to to just see the political process and what it meant for our communities as well. I'm also very privileged to be the chair of our board of directors here at Apathy's Boring. And it was one of the first youth civic engagement programs I saw at a national level that tapped into racialized youth, that supported black youth, and that supported youth with very little experience in the political process, gained that knowledge as well. And for me, this is very important. For, for most folks from marginalized communities, we don't really we don't really have access to the political process in the way that many white Canadians do or people who have been here for, for longer than we have. So I think it's really important to understand the privilege that comes with engaging in politics. And for me, it was seeing my loved ones, my community members, my neighbors and my communities not be able to live out the pot full potential of their lives is what made me engage in politics. And we actually have a framework at Apathy's Boring, our democracy framework, and I'm going to plug that. Please check it out. And it talks about some of the pillars that are necessary to have a healthy and functioning democracy. And three of those pillars include an inclusive and equitable participation, barrier-free access to human rights, and the peaceful coexistence and the right to protest. And we know that these pillars are not accessible to many folks from our community, and democracy is not working for our community. And this also, in turn, leads to a loss of trust in our institutions. Uh, and, and, and we know the impacts of anti-Black racism and Islamophobia in our communities. Canada is the leading country in the G7 for uh, uh, like Islamophobia and targeted killings against Muslim people. And we saw that with the verdict that just came from the Afsal family in London. And we know what and you know what it's like to be a black Canadian and what our communities face going through the education justice system and the healthcare system as well. So I think it's really important that when we talk about uh, navigating politics, the impacts that it has for our communities to face systemic barriers and not be represented has huge consequences for mental health, as well as being a young black Muslim woman female and entering spaces where we're just not recognized and we have to fight to be heard. And at every turn, you know, our thoughts are discounted. It doesn't matter if you have a master's of science, a PhD, if you're an expert in your space, when you enter that room, when you enter that boardroom, when you're talking to politicians, you constantly have to qualify yourself and to make your, your, your expertise known. And that is taking us back so far as a country. By not having inclusive participation, we're not going to have a healthy and functioning democracy. It's simply not possible. And we need to move faster to get that participation, the representation, but also the full acknowledgement of our communities in the political process. A round of applause for that, please. Thank you so much, Haban. And, you know, you touched on so many critical points there, but really focusing in on this idea of equitable access to political spaces, I think, is so incredibly critical.
especially from the perspective that, of course, everyone in this room can testify to the fact that politics affects each and every one of us. So, Miriam, I'm curious, when we talk about the, some of the systemic barriers that Haban mentioned, how do we actually go about dismantling those systemic barriers? And I want to think very blue sky here, but also get very tactical in terms of what does it look like to be able to ensure that we are recruiting and retaining the next generation of Canadians who feel that Canadian politics can actually be a space for them. Uh, Haban and I share some things in common, uh, including the fact that my first experience as a political practitioner in elected office was also with the Prime Minister of Canada. So I showed up and there I was at the table. Um, so to win an election, you need three things. You need money, you need volunteers, and you need votes. So if you know a candidate who you believe in, ask them to run yes, and then help get them there with those three things. And if you're going to ask somebody to run, though, here's the thing. I was the first woman from my riding to be elected and head to Ottawa. I was the first Afghan in Canada and Sadly, I'm the only so far to be elected and head to parliament. I was the first Muslim around the federal cabinet table. And at the time, I was the youngest at the federal cabinet table. Exciting, right? All these glass ceilings. Hey. Um, however, let's remember that the first one through the black, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the dark, mm, the first one to break the glass ceiling always gets bloodied. Mm. So if you're going to ask somebody to run, remember, you're going to ask them to be vulnerable, to put themselves out there, to represent your hopes and ambitions and aspirations for yourself, for your families, for your communities. So if you're going to ask somebody to run, be there with them for the long run. And so tactically, practically speaking, I'm so privileged. And by the way, politics is brutal, but I highly recommend it still. Um, the people who help get you there. The people who volunteer their time and efforts and share their time and treasure and their talent with you, they are, in my experience, the best of Canada. And they are the best reason to be part of any political community. So do it, but go into it eyes wide open. The barriers include having access to money. Uh, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a job that lets you take a big long leave and, you know, go knock on 35,000 doors, that's a privilege. So if you have that privilege, that's more, one more reason for you to run. But particularly for political parties and for communities asking different candidates, diverse candidates to run, recognize that economics are a big reason why people don't run. And then there is the quality of life that you are faced with or lack thereof once you enter politics. And those who work behind the scenes get it. Uh, those who've helped anybody run and get elected get it. Uh, it's like being in the you know left lane of the 401, uh, going 140 kilometers an hour and never stopping for maintenance or carpool, like uh, George was mentioning, never stopping to see the sites. You're just going nonstop. And that wear and tear gets to you. Um, I also want to just put a piece here for those of you who are thinking about running. Uh, and I really hope you do because being the first and only is really hard. So go into it eyes wide open. But if there is one other person kind of like you at the table, it makes a world of difference. And then if there's three of you, I was saying to, to a group uh, just before we start, if there are three of you at the table that are kind of the same, my goodness, you can, you can move a mountain. And so, you know, the more of us there are in those positions of power and influence, uh, the easier it gets. So set yourself up for success. Get a therapist. Get a coach. Surround yourself with the cabinet table, a kitchen cabinet of sorts, people who will take your calls and, you know, be there to commiserate and help you strategize who aren't there because they want something from you, but they're there because they believe in you. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I may, to the progressives who help progressive candidates get elected, get excited about politics and then get elected. 
Barack Obama, when he spoke in Ottawa a few years ago, said that progressives are a little neurotic. We are perfectionists and that we eat our own. You've got a candidate who meets 80% of your requirements, your aspirations, but you're going to give them a really hard time once they get into that difficult office for the 20% that they don't yet meet. That is not helpful. Eating our own is not helpful. So, you know, practically speaking, something that progressives who are always excited and celebrating every glass ceiling being shattered can do, once your candidate gets there, help support and keep them there because nothing hurts more than your own people giving you a hard time. Nothing hurts more than the people you're sticking your neck out for not having your back when you're doing that. Well, wow. Thank you, Miriam. Community over everything and being able to build that kitchen cabinet even before you make it to cabinet is super, super critical. So thank you. Dr. Lindo, we talk a lot about the power of authenticity. And we know that, of course, being in politics or being politically adjacent, uh, there are a lot of pressures, be it from your constituents, your parties, your supporters. What does it look like to actually hold authenticity as something that's paramount for you? And what is this intersection between authenticity and one's mental health? That's another really important question. Um, I feel sometimes that our political system prides itself in not being authentic, but in being performative. Mm. Eeks. But it's, it's about the pictures that you take and the communities that are recognized that you now have some kind of connection to, not because you've done the work with them, but because you took a picture with them, right? And the more of those pictures, especially in a world of social media, the more of those that you can put out, um, the more it appears as though you are doing a lot of this work. Stick a pin in that so that I can say this. Um, over the course of the last few years, I think that there's been a lot of work being done across party lines to get different kinds of people to run. So we want to have um, diverse representation at all of these tables, at all of these levels, and that's all fantastic. But a lot of the people that we ask to run are actually connected to those communities. And so gone are the times where you can just take a picture with an organization and say, I've done enough because I've, I've seen them, heard them say words, but I haven't actually engaged. And so the mental health piece for me has always been when we get somebody who is truly connected to community um, elected, how do we create a space within that political system for them to do their work when that work is going to look different? Um, because we've not been at those tables. I'll give you a concrete example. Um, when I was elected in 2018, it was the first time in Ontario's history that this huge number of Black people were elected to a single party. There were five of us, um, and we were all members of the official opposition, five. And um, to your point, though, we could move mountains. We did things differently within that space. And at the beginning, I think there was a lot of support within the party for the five of us coming together. Community leaders asked if we would form a caucus. And so we... Um, we decided, okay, yes, we will do this caucus. Um, I was the chair of the Black Caucus, and at the very beginning, things were glorious. People were very excited. There was a lot of promotions around it. There were um, fundraising campaigns around having this Black Caucus. But when the Black Caucus started to go into community across the province to get information about the kinds of change that was needed, there was resistance. There was resistance at all levels from the party, from the other parties. Nobody actually wanted to make change. We wanted to celebrate a glass ceiling being broken. We wanted to celebrate a moment in history, but we didn't want to change legislation to ensure that we addressed anti-Black racism in schools. We didn't want to address health care during the pandemic. I mean, I got in in 2018. Two years later, we're in the midst of a, a global pandemic, which nobody had anticipated. We couldn't get the government to have a hotspot strategy when the data was coming out saying that Black um, community members across the province were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Um, and they were the primarily the frontline healthcare workers. And so there's that piece when you're holding on your shoulders community because you 
represent and are connected to community in a tangible way, and you get to this position of power or the belly of the beast, the colonial system that has actually harmed many of us um, over the course of history, and then you want to try and do your work, that's when you start to see what resistance to change looks like. And you're holding that. And there is a mental health tool, but we don't, we often don't talk about it. We often talk about the fact that we should just be celebrating that we got to the table. And so that's why I think this conversation is so important because getting to the table was just like half a step. Mm -hmm. The actual work is once I get there, can I convince people to listen to me um, and to community? Can I be that sort of link to community so we can start making the change? And I think that if we don't have a serious conversation about how heavy that is to hold, we are going to burn people out who do actually make it over that hump, um, get to the table and then are left on their own, um, unable to make that change. I think that's a really important conversation for us to have. Definitely. And that risk of burnout is so real when you realize that, yes, people have championed for you to break a glass ceiling, but really you're just a token. So if we're not actually creating spaces to ensure that individuals can authentically show up as themselves and represent their communities, then I think we're all missing out, right? In the name of progress. Okay. Um, Haban, so we've talked a lot about this as being Instagram buddies. Curious as to hear your perspective in terms of the power of social media Yes, it's a beautiful thing, but also how do we use social media as a place to engage in healthy debates, uh, especially in the political sphere, as opposed to a lot of the negative and toxicity that we oftentimes see, especially in our own experiences with social media. What's your take on it? Well, thank you. That's a really good question. And uh, for Laura, thank you for sharing what that experience was like, because I was an intern when you were an MPP and I had to be objective and, you know, clear my social media and not have opinions on uh, issues that were impacting my community at the time. And it was very difficult, so I can only imagine what that was like for you as an elected official, but um, I loved hearing you speak. So that was that was great. I think when we talk about social media, we have to understand that it is a site of political violence for a lot of marginalized uh, communities and political leaders. So if you are a woman, if you are a racialized person, if you are part of the LGBT community, trans, non-binary, and you're putting yourself out there in a public space to speak on behalf of your communities, to push for policies that support and protect your communities, not only will you be facing that internal pressure and uh, violence, but when people can be anonymous on a site, for example, like Twitter, you're facing that violence as well. And um, I know this is something that you know very well, Miriam, and as well as Laura Maylindo, and maybe you can speak to that a, a bit more, but even not being a politician and being in the public eye was very, very difficult for my mental health when I was on the Prime Minister's Youth Council. I remember I interviewed the Prime Minister at uh, Reviving the Islamic Spirit, which is one of the largest Islamic conferences that happens here in North America. And we were talking about the rise in Islamophobia and right-wing extremism. And I had tweeted about it. And instantaneously over like the period of three hours, uh, a, a white supremacist had retweeted my tweet and I was doxxed online and I had no support or protection from the organizations that I was a part of. And here I was as a 23 year old left to deal with my safety alone. And I was really scared. The people were sending me death threats, horrific DMs. Um, it was a very difficult time. And it was actually women, uh, community leaders in the city uh, and across the province and country who reached out to me and supported me through that process. So for those who are uh, running for office or the political staffers in the room, they also face violence like this, but it's really important to know that, um, you know, Canada is a microcosm of the world. We have every community in this country. And as we think to the future of this country, it can be really scary to imagine the direction that we're going, especially in the, the past year or so. And I think it's really important that we ensure the full political participation of every community, but that doesn't just mean putting people up, having representation. It means really acknowledging communities, supporting them. And when you put them up, making sure you're protecting them, whether that's in online spaces I think there was a really interesting report I read in 2020. It was commissioned by Dr. Barbara Perry, who's a, a leading scholar on hate here in Canada and across the world. And they did an online environmental scan of right-wing extremism, and they found that Canada houses and creates a lot of these accounts, over 6,600 accounts across seven platforms. 
So it's a really big issue. And it's not only the leaders that are experiencing this, the communities are watching this happen online. It really pushes out good people from putting their name forward, but it also shows to us uh, how our country allows us to be treated as well. So it's really important that when we see hate, that when we see misogyny, that we see transphobia, when we see homophobia, when we see racism, Islamophobia, we really tackle it. And these political parties, um, our province, our federal government really takes takes it head on and stands with our communities in every aspect. And I think um, social media is not a fun place for many people like us, but I'd be curious to hear from the other panelists as well. Yes. Well, we, thank you so much, Haban, for sharing your experiences and for really echoing this important sentiment again about the power of community in terms of those individuals who are there to support you during such an incredibly isolating experience. I could only imagine what that must have been like. Um, but then as well, the need for our leaders to really step up and acknowledge the fact this is a pervasive issue. I mean, 6,600 plus accounts right here in Canada really sounds like the complete antithesis of what people would expect when they think of Canada, frankly, but I'll leave it at that because we know it's a much longer conversation. George, as we prepare to close, I'd really love for you to spend some time reflecting on your past 30 years in politics and the lessons that you've learned about the role of mental health from the lens of what advice would you give to some of the younger individuals in this room who are just looking to embark on their political journey for the first time? I think I've been at it longer than 30 years. I think you got to an old bio that's kind of great because I haven't aged in it, but... Uh... <laughs> The thing is, uh, my experience is uh, is uh, is different, but has some parallels. Uh, maybe I could just comment on a few things. Firstly, is uh, uh, politics is the ultimate sacrifice, which provides, in a sense, the not the ultimate sacrifice. We all know that obviously that's death in service to one's country or what have you, or community. Uh, but is also uh, shouldn't be misunderstood. Uh, for the bounty that it offers for those that are open to public service. I got 10 bad stories. I got 10,000 good ones. And two of them are here today. My dear friend, Leticia and Howard Brown, that I've known over decades, are examples of what I described recently to uh, a crowd as uh, the trinkets that come from a life served. I, I was at given the opportunity to speak recently at someone's memorial he had the order of canada and i said at one time i like to count the order of canada trinkets in my riding that i knew and had relationship with and so as much as anything politics can be all of those challenges and it can especially in the world of social media if you're open to it expose you to an onslaught of this that and the other uh, but at the same time, I think that there's a really, really strong opportunity that we miss the point, which is that the team element of politics for many of us, the community aspect, which without it, you're not going to be elected or successful. And I dare say for me, the family of it. I walked into a political campaign nominating meeting for the liberal candidate in Etobicoke Center as a 15 year old. I didn't get, I might've got dropped off by my dad. I it wasn't that my parents were involved in politics. They had grade six and grade 10 educations and all they knew to do was to work, to advance the circumstances for their family. And I found there, because I'm old enough, a liberal campaign environment dominated by women who later in life were actually elected and playing those roles, but at that time, were housewives, but of an extraordinary caliber. One was Senator Mary, one went on to be Senator Marion Maloney. One was a woman named Simone Flaff, who's, you know, one was a woman named B. Yak. All these incredible women that were part of a family and actually created a nurturing environment for me alongside a time when my parents' own relationship had fallen apart. I was loved by both sides at all time. Don't but there were sides and there were divisions and there were conflicts and they were out forming new relationships and the Liberal Party took me in as part of its family. I was elected as the first gay MPP in Ontario and I joke only the 200th in history. Uh, uh, it, you know, um, 
And uh, the thing about it is that for me, I was already in a certain sense, a well-known and significant force in politics from having served as a political staffer to a premier, to federal cabinet ministers, to a mayor of Toronto and to all of that. And I do recognize that my, that um, my, my white privilege is like, I speak about my white privilege actually more in the context of a long period of drug use where I have no criminal sanction associated with it. Like I get, I, I, I get that, uh, I get that this is not the same path for everybody because I used my drugs in private rather than, you know, in, 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 because my socioeconomic status or whatever was, uh, was allowing for it. But uh, when I arrived in the Ontario legislature, notwithstanding the fact that there have been lots of gay people before, the Ontario legislature had a bad rap with respect to L the, the gay population, having to do with the way that they forcibly removed Reverend Brent Hawks and others from the legislature, and tremendous divisions even within the, within the Liberal Party, which had not advanced its record and reputation voting in favor of uh, gay people. And uh, I was fortunate enough actually that my event of the election, the conservatives were there with the Supreme Court forcing them to bring statues up to state for uh, equality and all of that provided an opportunity where my inaugural speech in the Ontario legislature was actually talking about setting a seat at the table for gay people. And uh, uh, really, I used the point and privilege that I had to try and make sure that I reflected in every effort that I could the riding that I represented, which was Toronto Centre, Rosedale at the time, most diverse in all matters imaginable, including from the standpoint of ethnocultural diversity. And I'm pleased to tell you that for the efforts and opportunities that I had, Ahmed Hussain is a member of parliament and a cabinet minister, and Salma Zahid is a member of parliament, uh, in part because of the work that they got to do with me and I really did, I think, fulfill the objective which was met in pushing them forward to run, supporting them to the hilt and all through that. In my time as Minister of Health, the Ministry of Health controls more than half of all the appointments in the government of Ontario. And if you look at the profile of people that we appointed, they really were more reflective than ever of the people of the province of Ontario. But I really didn't realize full well that we sent many people off who were reflective of a community and had a certain capability, but weren't really really ready or to be contextualized, how to say that, when they arrived at the board of the regulatory college where they were up against, you know, this, that and the other, like, I realized our good intentions in a sense we sent people out into isolated spots where the role hadn't been properly carved out for them. And we expected and hoped of them to be trailblazers on matter of policy, breaking down barriers for, you know, newcomers facing barriers to access to professions and all the like. All I could say is that like uh, mental, you know, in relation to mental health, um, uh, politics can be a challenging environment for it but at the same time it's a tremendous opportunity because there are so many points where you have to connect with people and uh, we were talking uh, earlier on is like politics at the community level the practitioners of assistance working in offices is misunderstood in my opinion i always viewed it as social work by another name and i viewed my writing association and i viewed my office as a community service organizations i didn't call my constituency i don't like the word constituency i never found it a very accessible word i called my office a community action center and we really tried to orient ourselves uh, ourselves uh, that way I'm not sure any of this answers the question about mental health, except to say my own mental health uh, played itself out in the way that I was as a politician. And the downside of that uh, was that, and I'm still apologizing for it to my staff as I met with them on the 20th anniversary of becoming Minister of Health, is that I was prone to excess and I worked people too hard and we had uh, disregard for life work balance and we were measuring people more like lawyers and doctors, like how many hours can we get out of them before they collapse and all of that. So, you know, that's uh, I realized was a reflection of the own fragilities of my mental health. You know, I arrived there to run the largest government department in Canada without 
like most people do <laughs> without the training for it. Right? And uh, the pressures associated with it were extraordinary and I didn't manage them all perfectly. I sought out professional help here and there where I could. And in my book and in my personal appearances with people, I'm still apologizing for some of the excesses associated with the limitations of my mental health uh, and the way that I, and the way that I, uh, the way that I serve. But at the same time, uh, don't, don't mistake politics for a bountiful opportunity to, if you're open to it, to meet people from more walks of life and experiences than in every other, any other place. And if you play your hand well, or if you're really lucky like I was, you might even get a chance to influence a wide variety of events that you can always point to your kids as your legacy, that building and that bridge and this, that, and the other. Thank you. Beautiful note to end on. Thank you so much, George. A round of applause for our panelists, please.